13. And I want to continue what we started last week, Easter Sunday. I want to continue that, and you can turn this down just a little bit if it's able, if you're able to. And um, I feel we need to continue this message with for just a couple weeks. We were talking about graves into gardens. The fact that God wants to turn your grave, the dead things in your life, the things that seem hopeless, the same things that seem uh, just lost, God wants to bring life. Amen. He wants to bring life to every part of you. Amen. Uh, that's what he does. He takes dead things and he brings them back to life. But we've been talking about graves into gardens. And, a, you know, a graveyard can be a pretty depressing place. You know, if you walk through a graveyard and you look at the tombstones and you see the, the memories of a past life. And, and it, can be a, it can be a sad thing. Um, I read about a tombstone that a man inscribed or he actually, he actually created it to, to honor his wife who passed away. And here's what it said. He said, here, here lies Jamie Smith. Wife of Thomas Smith, marble cutter. This monument was erected by her husband as a tribute to her memory and a specimen of his work. Monuments of the same style, $350. Can you imagine seeing that headstone? Um, and maybe he sold some headstones from that. I don't know. But, um, but if, if you were to walk in a graveyard 2,000 years ago, uh, they found some headstones that they, or whatever they would have used as a type of headstone back then. And, and um, here's what one of the inscriptions read uh, from the time of Christ. And, and even as Paul, remember he was walking through the different places. He said, he, it said this, I was not, this is the inscription, I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. And I think what a sad commentary on life and death without Christ. I am not and I care not. I guess not because they're dead. But the grave, thank you. Okay, the grave is a place of defeat. Um, but when Jesus rose from the dead, listen, he defeated death, hell, and the grave, didn't he? The grave's been defeated. Now, if you're facing death without Christ, I can't imagine how sad that would be. If you're facing a hopeless situation without Christ, that would be depressing. But listen, because Jesus defeated death, hell, in the grave, yes, that means you, come on, that means you can, you can defeat death, hell, in the grave. He defeated it for you. He can turn that thing around. You know, we said on, on Friday, we called it Good Friday. But you looked at what happened in that video and it didn't seem like a good Friday. But we can call it a good Friday because of Sunday. And in your life, you might be going through some things today and you say, it's, it feels like a pretty rough day, but you're going to be able to look back and say, it was good because I can see God was working in my life. Amen. And so this morning, I want to share this story in Ezekiel 37. I want you to go here with me. And we sang about the the dry bones rattling this morning. I want to share the story about the dry bones rattling. And Ezekiel 37, verse 1, it starts off this way. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Then he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I replied, Lord God, only you know. Let me just stop there for a minute. So God shows Ezekiel this vision, right? The famous vision, we've all heard about it. He's, he's standing in this valley of bones. Not bodies, bones. Just piled up bones. I can't imagine what must have happened to just leave a pile of bones everywhere. But that's all he sees. And they're not just bones. He says they're dry bones. Right? That means they're, they're brittle, they're old, they've been there a long time, there's no, there's no life left in them, right? And he, he, he sees all this, and God asks the question, can these bones live? What a question, right? Can these bones live? Now imagine you're Ezekiel, and you're standing there, and God shows you a vision of just dry bones, and he asks you, can these bones live? What are you going to say? Right? Um, it's, a faith, it's a faith question. This question challenges Ezekiel's faith. 
Um, it's, not, it's not a logical question because in, in the natural mind, what would you do? You'd say, well, no, right? The answer is no, God. Can the bones live? No, there's no, there's no possible way bones can come back to life. But it's, God's not asking a logical question, right? It's a faith-based question. It's based on his, what he's feeling, hearing in his spirit. And again, in the natural, you'd look at it, you'd say, that's a, that's a no-brainer. No, they can't come back to, you know, you like no-brainer questions because you don't have to actually use your brain. You just answer. Well, no, it's obvious. And God wants you to get to a place where you're not focused on what you can see, where you're not focused on how things seem, the logical side of things. God wants to get you to a place where you can answer him by faith. And it takes faith Come on, to answer, to speak the word of God. God, listen, God does not make sense to our natural minds. Am I right? Um, you, read the, you read the word of God, and this is not a logical word. It's not logical to think a 100-year-old woman could give birth to a child. That's not logical. I saw, I saw in the news the other day, a 75-year-old woman just gave birth to twins. I don't, I don't know how that's possible. I didn't know that was possible. But listen, if you're older in here, there's still hope for you. If you we'll pray for you. True story. Yeah, it happened in, in Uganda. Uh, I don't know what's going on over there, but something, something incredible. But it's not, it's not logical to think that that's normal. It's not logical to think a little boy can kill a giant, right? It's just not logical. But this, this word is not logical. It's not logical to think a virgin should conceive and give birth to a child, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's not logical. But the word of God is not logical. It's not based on what you can think. It's based on, the, on faith. Amen. So here's what I want you to think about for a minute. What if God came to you and asked you a question like that? You know, um, maybe, maybe it's not a pile of dead bones, but maybe, maybe it's some kind of dead thing in your life. Something you've given up on, some dreams, some, some hope that you used to have, some, some maybe whatever it might be, some situation, and God said, could that live? What would your answer be? See, are you going to answer him based on what you feel? Are you going to answer him based on what you've seen in the past or what your mind tells you? Or are you going to answer based on what God can do, okay? Um, listen, again, maybe there's some things in your life, you'd call them dead. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a physical thing, some limitation, some issue you've been dealing with, and you just said, I'm going to have to deal with that my whole life. And what if God came and said, can that thing live? You know? Hey, maybe, maybe you've got a child who's far from God today, and you've almost given up hope. And what if God came to you and said, can this boy be born again? What would you say? See, we got to start thinking a little bit different, church. Um, you know, it's again, it's uh, God's not asking what's possible in the natural. He's asking what can you believe Him for. Listen, if Moses had only believed for what's possible, he never would have parted the Red Sea, right? Come on, you can't you can't believe God for what's possible. You got to start believing for the impossible. That's the nature of faith. So what I want to ask is, can dead things in your life live again? You know, God, God might not be coming to you literally and saying, hey, can this thing live? But you have to start looking at your life from faith by the Spirit of God. Because there are things in your life today, listen, I believe this, there are things in your life today that God wants to do, but you've been limiting him because you're still stuck in a natural mindset. The natural mindset will kill you. It's, it's, it's not faith-based. The natural mindset is death-based, right? Look at Romans 8, verse 5. We've, we've, we've looked at this before. Look at it again. We're remembering. We're reminding ourselves. Those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. Okay, so if you're, if you're, if you're living according to what this flesh, what this body wants, you're thinking about those kinds of things. But if you are living according to the Spirit, then you've got your mind on different things, on spirit things. 
Look at verse 6. For the mindset of the flesh is death. There's a mindset that your, that your, that your flesh has, and it's death-based. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Amen. So there's two different minds that could be at work in you. You could have the mind of the flesh or the mind of the spirit. He says in verse 7, the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law. It's unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh can't please God, but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit since the spirit of God lives in you. So I want you to see this. You've got, there's two different mindsets. Your natural mindset is designed to always take you towards death. That's just how it's, that's the nature of it. It's, it's a death-based mindset. And, and I don't even mean just natural, the grave. I mean just even in a sense of um, I'm going to have decrease, I'm going to have lack, I'm gonna, not going to have enough, that kind of thing. That mindset will take you towards the grave. Here's how the mat- natural mind thinks. It says this, I don't have enough. I'm not going to make it. This is going to fail. The natural mind lives in worry, it panics, and it builds worst-case scenarios. Am I right? Have you been there? You start thinking about how often does your mind run into the things that could go right? Not too often. What does our mind tend to do? What could go wrong here? How many things could go wrong? That's a natural mindset. That's not the mindset of the spirit. It's the mindset of the flesh. The mindset of the, of the flesh will create worst-case scenarios because it is thinking along the lines of death. But if you think different, if you get something different in you, you start getting living according to the Spirit of God, you're going to think a little different. But see, that, that fleshly mindset can't please God. What does he say in Hebrews 11? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right? You, if you don't have faith, you can't please God. So there's a different mindset I want you to think about. The mindset, he says, the mindset of the spirit is what? It's life and it's peace. You can, that gives you a good identifier to what mindset you're in. Am I thinking about life? Is it bringing me to peace? Or am I thinking about death? Am I Am I leaning towards worry? That's how do I know what mindset I'm in? Is it worry or is it peace? And now when I've identified it, ooh, I'm, you know what? I'm thinking about the wrong things because I'm getting into worry. That tells me I'm in a natural mindset. You know what I need to do? I need to step back. And, and Holy Spirit, I want to get into a place where I'm thinking about the things of the Spirit. I'm thinking about spiritual things. I'm thinking about the things that you have for me. I want to think about what this word says you have for me. Oh, what does it say? You you said I'm always going to have plenty. There's no lack. So, Lord, that's what I believe. It may not be logical. It may not be practical, but it's what your word says. So I'm going to lean that way and start leaning on the spirit of God and live with life and peace. A spirit-centered mind, here's what it'll sound like. I've got plenty, okay? I will make it. This will work. It will create a positive outcome in your mind. Listen, your, your mind, God gave you a mind, and sometimes we think, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't use our minds. We should, if we're spiritual, we should just rely on the spirit. No, your mind is supposed to work together with your spirit. See, it, God didn't say, he, he didn't say, I gave you a mind, but make sure you don't use it. No, he wants you to use your brain. That's a, it can be a good thing if you use it right. But you've got to start letting it be engaged by the word of God, by the spirit of God. You've got to, you've got to get renewed. That's why you've got to get a renewed mind. And when you get a renewed mind, you can start thinking about what God has said. You can start meditating. Have you heard that word? Meditate on the word of God. That word doesn't mean to sit uh, on top of a mountain somewhere and go, mm, you know, that's got nothing to do with, with godly meditation. What godly meditation is, is to get this word inside of you and chew on it. And it literally means to chew. So I just keep 
it, I just keep basically muttering the word of God to myself, reminding myself of the word of God, because when I do that, it's going to get in here and it's going to get down in here. So the mind can create some positive outcomes for you. And listen, I firmly believe you've got to be able to see some things before you're going to be able to, to have it. You've got to see it before you can do it. You know, you ask somebody who builds, builds a house, that somebody's got to see that thing. Am I right, Bobby? Somebody's got to have some kind of plan drawn out. they got to be able to see that thing before they can build it. You've got to be able to see God doing things in your life before you're going to see him. He goes on to say that the natural mind is actually hostile to God. It refuses to submit to God. The natural mind insists on having its own way. I'll tell you what, the natural, the natural side of you is basically just a giant baby. That's how I look at it. It's, it's the side of you that when it sees the, the box of donuts, it wants the box of donuts. It doesn't want one donut, it wants the box of donuts. That's the natural side of you. And you've got to learn to put that thing into submission. But the natural side, the natural mind, it doesn't want to submit. It wants to do what it wants. It wants to do what feels good. It wants to do what it likes. Am I right? But you've got to learn how to, how to not live by the natural side of you, but how to live by the supernatural side of you because you've been born again and you've got the Spirit of God in you and you've got a new mind and you've got the mind of Christ. But you've got to start living like it. That's the hard part. The natural mind will never receive anything from God because it, it will never be able to see dry bones living. It will never be able to act in faith. I heard about a family that loved doing jigsaw puzzles, right? Uh, they, they, would, they, just, they just loved it. And one day the father brought home a box of, uh, with, a, with a new jigsaw puzzle in it, a thousand-piece puzzle. And they, they, right away the family went to work just trying to put those things together. And after about an hour, they got so frustrated, and they, they couldn't figure out why things weren't going where they were supposed to. And finally, the dad stopped, and he looked, and he said, oops, I made a mistake. He said, I accidentally switched the tops of the, the box. So they were looking at the wrong puzzle. And nothing made sense. Nothing was working together. And here's what I want you to hear. We've got to get our, our natural mind under control because when we try to process God's plans with our natural minds, it just won't, nothing will fit together. Nothing will make sense. And what God, God will be telling us, I want you to do this, and we'll say, why on earth would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. No, the, the logical side of me says, I need to do it this way. And God's saying, then you're not going to get what you, what you want from me. Because you can't do things your own way, you've got to submit to him. Are you with me? We talk about... Romans 12, 2 all the time, just throw that up there. Don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. You got to get your mind renewed. Because if God came and said, can these things live, you can't go asking your mind for its opinion. What do you, what do you think? He's going to tell you no. It's not, this is impossible. You can't lean on your own understanding. But a lot of Christians are running around with unconformed minds, and they wonder why they're not seeing different results in their lives. Am I right about that? Because if, here's, here's what it comes down to. If God came down right now and said, could these things live? They'd say, no, no, sir. No, sir. They can't imagine the impossible because they're stuck in the carnal mindset. Let me keep going in the story. Ezekiel 37, verse 4. So God said to Ezekiel, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I'll cause breath to enter you and you'll live. I'll put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you so you'll come to life. Then you'll know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet a vast army. So Ezekiel told, told God, here's, listen again to Ezekiel's answer. Can these bones live? What does Ezekiel say? He doesn't say, yes, yes, sir, if you say, and he said, Lord, only you know. I guess it was more of a maybe. Okay, Lord, maybe. But a maybe is still better than a no. And you know what? God could have said, 
He could have said, you're right, Ezekiel, I know. And, he, and God could have been the one to say, dry bones, get up and live. Am I right? But what did God tell Ezekiel to do? Prophesy. Okay. He's a prophet. He knew how to do that. Prophet, the prophet speaks what God tells him to, speaks the word of the Lord. So God told Ezekiel to prophesy. Why? Couldn't, I mean, really think about the story. Couldn't God have just said, bones, get up? Let me show you, let me show you a demonstration, because it's just a vision anyway, isn't it? God could have said, bones, get up and live. Breath enter you, tendons and all these things. But he didn't. He had Ezekiel speak to them. And here's what I, I want you to catch. Ezekiel had a part to play in the plan of God for his life, okay? You, you must catch this. If you, if you don't get anything else out of this today, get this. You must get involved with God's plan for your life, you know? I've said this before, but some people think, if God wants to do it in my life, well, go ahead, Lord. No, he doesn't work that way. He wants you involved in your life. He wants you receiving the word and acting on it doing something with it. That's why he says faith without works is dead. You've got to do something. He partners with his people, right? We talked about the covenant this morning. That's what the covenant is, is God partnering with man. And a covenant is an agreement between two parties, right? So God makes this, he makes this arrangement with man. He works, always works together with man. God makes the promise, you have to believe it and act on it. It's a divine partnership, right? God became man, to save mankind, but now he uses man to reach the world. So unless Ezekiel had followed God's instructions, listen, nothing would have happened to the bones. God might have found somebody else, but there, nothing would have happened at that moment if God had said, hey, prophesy to the bones, and Ezekiel said, ooh, that's the Lord, I don't know about all that. Nothing would have happened. So if God says to you, can these things live, you better, you better make sure you get his word in your mouth. Get his word in your mouth. I've said this stuff before, but I'm reminding you of some things. God wants to work with you. He wants to partner with you. And I believe if you're going to see dry bones live, if you're going to see graves become gardens in your life, you're going to have to do something. So Ezekiel had to prophesy. He had to speak what God told him to say. He had to release the word of God over the bones. He released the word of God by faith, and right as he spoke, things went to work right as he's speaking, yeah? Look what God said to him to say. Prophesy this. I'll cause breath to enter you, and you'll live. Now, he's talking to a bunch of bones, but he's telling them, hey, bones, life is coming. Life is coming, but they're, still, they're just a pile of bones. And then he tells them, start Start, start, prophesy that tendons would come and all the, the flesh would come and all this kind of stuff. Life was coming, and he started with life is coming, but first he told tendons to come. And then he, he you know, there had to be, you can't just have bones that stand up and live because that would be scary. You had to have, you had to have um, muscles and tendons to begin to grow. You had to have flesh and skin and, and blood had to come from so all these things. Organs had to be made. All the parts of the body had to come together before they could sustain life. But the first thing he spoke was, you're going to live. And I said this last week, God knows the beginning from the end, doesn't he? And God, I, I love this because God talks about the end like it's already here. Isn't that how he talked? Jesus, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He called Jesus the lamb slain before he even started the world. He talked about Jesus like he'd already come and died on the cross for you. That's how God talks. The God that says, let there be light. And then on day four, he says, oh, yeah, how about, how about a son? Let's make a son now. He doesn't worry. Where did the light come from? He's not worried about that. He just told light to come. You with me? God, God talks different than we talk. And God wanted Ezekiel to talk like he talked. And I believe if you're going to see things turn around, you've got to start talking like him. See, we get, we get ourselves in trouble with our mouths, don't we? we? We say we believe this word and we go home and we talk about how bad our situation is. What we need to do is start speaking life over ourselves, speaking life over our family, speaking life over our situation. Start talking like God talks. 
Listen, it doesn't matter how dead things look. What we need to do is start prophesying. See, the prophets understood they could talk about the future, didn't they? Ezekiel spoke about bones coming because God showed him things. Isaiah prophesied. He said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. But Jesus hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He hadn't even been born yet. But Isaiah prophesied like it was done because God told him it was done. See, God calls things that are not like they are, and we've got to start calling things like they are. Stop calling them like your mind tells you they are. Stop calling them like you see them in the natural and and start seeing, listen, start seeing through a different mindset. Let me keep going. Verse 11. I'm getting ready to close it here. He said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up for them from them, my people, and lead you into the land of Israel. You will know that I, the Lord, am the Lord, my people, when I open up your graves and bring you up from them, I'll put my spirit in you and you live. So God tells Ezekiel what this whole thing means. He says, he says these bones represent his people, right? They've been lost. They've been hopeless. They're dead. But God is about to open the graves and bring them out. God wanted his people to know there was hope beyond where they were right at that moment. There was a light at the end of the tunnel. And even things, even though things looked bad, like they were just a pile of old bones. I mean, imagine feeling like you're just a pile of old bones. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Maybe you feel like in some area of your life, it's just a pile of bones. Maybe it's not your body, but maybe it's your business. Maybe it's some family situation that you're dealing with. Maybe it's so, it just feels like death. It just feels like a pile of bones. It feels like you're in the grave. Like you got one foot in the grave, right? People say that. I feel like I got one foot in the grave. Well, here's what I want you to hear. Things don't have to stay the way they are. Things don't have to lead to the grave. Bones don't have to stay bones. They can come alive. Listen, because if God says it, you can believe it and you can act on it. And I want you to know today, if you feel hopeless, there's hope for you. Listen, if there's some area in your life that it just feels like death warmed over, God still brings dead things to life. You don't have to stay where you are because of what Jesus has done for you. Because he defeated death, hell, and the grave, you can live victorious. Amen. You don't have to stay defeated anymore. I want to read this scripture this morning as I get ready to close. In, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. We open the service with this. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so you may know what is the hope of his calling the glorious riches of his inheritance among the the saints and the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength. So he's talking about the power of God that's at work in your life. Did you catch that? He wants you to know the immeasurable, that means you can't measure it, the immeasurable greatness of his power to you. Did I read that right? The greatness of his power to you who believe. And listen to verse 20. He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead, and he seated him at his right hand in the heavens. Now listen, he could have said the mighty power of God, he demonstrated this power when he created the world from nothing. He didn't say that. He pointed to something more powerful. He could have said, he could have said he demonstrated this power When he parted the Red Sea and he brought the people out on dry land and he drowned an army in the sea, but he didn't say that. He pointed to something more powerful. He said he demonstrated this power when he, come on, when Jesus was raised from the dead. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it was the most powerful thing God had ever done in the history of the world. Listen, we read it last week. The whole earth shook. And I believe all of heaven shook. I believe all of hell, the the depths of hell, shook when Jesus rose from the dead. And I bet the devil jumped up out of his seat and said, what in the world was that? What is going on down here? We got to get to that. They found out he's alive. Come on. It was the most powerful 
thing that ever happened. But listen, it was powerful, not just because Jesus was raised, but because, and not just because he defeated death, hell, and the grave for himself. He defeated death, hell, and the grave for everyone who will believe. Come on, that's why it was the most powerful thing, because he just didn't defeat it for him. He defeated it for you and me. And when death, hell, and the grave shook, it shook because it realized it lost its hold on you. It lost its hold on this world because if you believe, you don't have to die and go to hell. You can be with Jesus forever. Death lost its hold. So you can say like like he said in Ezekiel, open the grave. Come on, open the grave. I'm coming out. He goes on to say this in Ephesians 2, 6. Because he didn't, listen, he says, he says he seated Christ. He raised him from the right hand, from the dead and seated him at his right hand. And he goes on to say in verse 6 of chapter 2, together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and he seated us in the heavens. Listen to me, church. You've already been raised. When you step out of this life, you step right into the next. You don't have to, you don't have to wait for some day, if some, some resurrection day, as good as that will be, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. That's why you don't have to wait for some day. Your, your resurrection life starts now. In Christ Jesus, you're living a resurrection, spirit-filled, power-filled life. Amen. And you're, he says you're seated in the heavens. And I, you got to understand this this morning. When he says you're seated in the heavens, he's talking about your seat of authority. If you come into the presence of a king, what do you do? You're supposed to bow. Right? When you would come into the presence of a king, you would bow and say, oh, king. The, there was nobody sitting in the presence of the king except for maybe the queen and the, and the family, the royal family. So when you come into the presence of God, he says, oh, I got your seat, son. Come sit down here next to me. Come sit with me in Jesus. There's nothing, listen, there's nothing in this world that can, that can kill you. There's nothing in this world that can hurt you. There's nothing in this world that can destroy you because you are seated with Christ Jesus. You have authority. This, Jesus said, "He all authority had been given unto him. Didn't he say that? But then he gave it to us. See, you're seated. Why don't you stand up with me since you know you're seated? Okay. Now we can talk about that. Because you're seated, what that means. But let's, let's close here. Listen, I want you to catch this. He raised you up. And today, maybe you feel like you've got one foot in the grave. Maybe you feel broken and defeated. And you're looking at a situation that seems hopeless. But listen, your reality is you're already raised. God sees the end from the beginning. He sees you already living the resurrected life. Listen, he sees you already healed today. He sees your kids already born again. you got to start seeing things like God does. Why don't you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here and you need prayer for anything at all this morning, I want to just open up the altars. If you need, want us to agree in prayer for healing for some situation in your family, a situation that, that is going on. Maybe you want to stand in for somebody. We just want to be here and pray for you this morning and agree with you because I believe there's power in agreement and there's power in our prayers and God does things when we pray. I believe that. So if you, need, if you need prayer this morning, the altars are open. For the rest of you, I want to ask you if there's anything that you need in your life, if God were to come to you today, and say, can this thing live? What would you say? And is there something in your life that you're saying, I'm believing God for this thing to live. I'm believing God for life today. I'm believing God for healing today. I'm believing God for this miracle today. I want you, if you're believing God for something today, I want you to just right where you are, raise your hand. Right where you are. You're believing God for a miracle today. And just together with our hands raised, let's just make this faith declaration. Just say with me, Jesus, I thank you for your word. Lord, I choose to believe your word today. I choose to stand on what your word says about me. Not what my mind says, 
Not what people tell me, but what you say. Because your word is truth. And Lord, I speak your word over my life. I declare healing today right now in the name of Jesus just to come upon you. I declare just, just miracles to flow. I declare healing in families. I declare healing in marriages. Whatever you might need today, Lord, I just thank you for moving in this place right now. Just touch each one in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.